the minute somebody is fully committed or dedicated, even in that instant, that's where the devil starts his attack, his method, his see if we can wear you down. Maybe you'll just think you've got such bad luck or you're such a bad person or it couldn't be for you. And this is why I always tell people, expect this. It's not going to be you come and everything goes good. It's going to be you come and everything breaks down and goes to hell in a handbasket until you recognize this is a test that the trying of your faith Good morning. Um, unfortunately, I cannot be with you this morning. And um, I'm looking forward to being back with you in the sanctuary. But um, we're going to try and get through this morning. So let's get to the message. Uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That's what the scripture says. The Apostle Paul said that, and it's, it's quite a statement. But let me just kind of move around this because there's there's something here that I feel is very important. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So do you feel like a new creature? Do people feel like maybe people know when they came to know the Lord? Maybe they don't. But the question is, what implications again should that have on me and my faith? Now, let me just say this. Most of us will remember the first time we heard the message that opened our eyes. And you knew you were hearing something different. Now, wherever you were listening to, that's not the point, because it's God doing basically the talking through his servants. So maybe when you were hearing for the first time, it was radical. It was different, like scales falling from your eyes, the joy the innocence, the feeling of overwhelmingness, maybe of contentment, I'm not quite sure. But then something seems to happen, and I think it happens to each and every one of us. Um, that tender joy, that peaceful feeling, all the things you couldn't explain that started at the beginning. Let's just say you've been a Christian for 10, 15, 20 years. Somehow it's not as fresh, it's not as joyful, whatever that means. Maybe the desire is not as strong as it was to pray or to read or to dig or to research. I don't know. But maybe also when we pray, it's not quite the same as before. Like There's not the same drive. Now, I'm not saying that this is you, maybe some of you out there. And that brings me back to the statement that Paul made, being a new creature in Christ. And why is this important? Because unless we kind of understand what is said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we might get a little bit confused about, we'll call it viewing ourselves aright. So um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it basically refers to the body, soul, and spirit. Three are mentioned there. So for this lesson, if you're not viewing yourself in three parts, it's going to be very difficult to comprehend what I'm saying. See, the Bible does distinguish between soul and spirit, according to Hebrews 4.12. So you've got many self-help guides within the Christian realm, not outside, not in the secular, but the Christian realm, which is actually an oxymoron, self-help within the body of Christ. That doesn't even make sense. but people that tend to focus on the subconscious or they call it the psyche, whatever that is. And somehow they're missing the mark on all this. It has nothing to do with that. Let's see if we can make this plain and understandable. The moment of salvation in Christ, your spirit was enlivened with the spirit of God. When that spirit became even for a moment head over your soul, which encompasses your emotions, your intellect, your body, the physical part of you that had been the boss. Calling the shots for so long, overwhelmed the new spirit life in you, basically putting the body and the flesh back in control. So when we pray, every time when we pray, we seem to be quieted inside, and then there's a sense of some otherness within us. But the moment the prayer is over, 
Let's see if this is some of you. You don't need to raise your hand. An automatic switch back to that once more where I was previously. In other words, nothing changes. So I think a lot of times people just stop praying or they pray less. And that still small voice seems to be quieted. What can be done to help us then? That's the question. Because I don't think I'm addressing everybody. I'm just, I'm addressing some, not all. So what can be done to help us? That our body and soul could become more dependent on God's operations, letting the Spirit strengthen us within us. So here's where much confusion and people can get very hung up on terminology. And I want to make this clear because sometimes I think using analogies helps. So let's compare ourselves to Niagara Falls. That's a weird example, but Niagara Falls, this incredible force of water that has 3,160 tons of water flowing over it every second. But if you've ever stood at the falls, you would be able to feel the power of the water, that brute force. And let's just say it like this. If the power of the falls is left alone and untouched, you've got this majestic display of great natural force. But if you harness the force, you have something called hydroelectricity. So you might say, well, what does that have to do with, or how do you make the connections? So I have been talking about the Holy Spirit. And if you think about the analogy I just gave, we're looking at being sealed, um, being that deposit and being sealed. There's the power, uh, but there's, it's almost like knowing how to harness the power. And I, I hate to say it, so I'm not trying to be blasphemous, but these are the things when I've talked about being equipped, but then maybe not knowing that we even have tools or how to use them. So. I've been talking about being born again from above, receiving the deposit of the Spirit, being sealed. Uh, those are all His operations. We don't have any part in that. Also, there's another aspect that I think may not be understood, and that is there are those that say there must be some second, second definite work or a second definite work of grace or something like that. No, this is not a second work. This is all part of one uh, one giant concept that's seldom, if ever, understood. So there's not a second work. There's there's only one work, and it's ongoing. It's for us to grab hold of what exactly that means. You've got whole denominations that promote the second second definite work of grace. Uh, I I'm not really sure that that's biblical. I know that that interpretation comes out of the fact that you've got people receiving the gifts or the endowment of the Spirit after. So I'm sure that that's where that came from. But um, to say that that is a doctrine in and of itself, because this happened in the book of Acts, is probably not exactly so. There's always a kernel of truth somewhere. It's for us to, to find it. So it seems like when we start using the term baptism of or in or by the Holy Spirit, that there, there are enough things to get confused over. The Bible speaks of Jesus, for example, baptizing in the Holy Spirit, not an outward visible act. And there is a paradox to this, because if you think about it, Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit. And if you read the book of Acts, that encounter, that happening, that event wasn't the Holy Spirit Ditch, dispatched by the Holy Spirit to the people. It was the promise of the Father given by the Son. But the baptism, if you read carefully, it says Jesus baptizing in the Holy Spirit. So that's one. Now, if we use the baptize, the word baptize in the classical Greek was used of sunken ships, an inundation causing the Spirit to swell and the flood to flood our soul. These are concepts that, again, if not properly understood, because we read by and we encounter the word baptism, there were people that were baptized in John's baptism. That was strictly water, and they didn't know about Jesus. Then there are people who 
do get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or some baptized in Jesus' name alone. But to be baptized in the Spirit, by the Spirit, through the Spirit, comes from Christ, and it's not has nothing to do with water. So we can kind of start looking at when you read and distinguish between those people that they heard the message, they believed, they were baptized versus being baptized in or by or through the Holy Spirit by way of Jesus Christ. Now, Philippians explains that he condescended and for a time took on our limitations by taking on our body and humanity. He was all God and all man all at the same time, and he subjected himself to many things we're exposed to. I've said many times that is the way we were able to identify with him. And Luke 2.52 says that Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. So even there, if you want to look at how, if Jesus is a pattern for us, there was a progression. We too must progress. We encounter the very early life of Jesus briefly. Very few verses tell us about his miraculous birth, brief mentions of his childhood, and that he was preparing for his public ministry somewhere around the age, possibly, of 30. But no one had the inclination that he was God in the flesh. If you recall, his mother and his brothers, for the rest of his family, they were wanting to put him away. In fact, it says in Matthew 13, they're asking, who does he think he is? So it's very clear that they could not recognize who or what he was. That's just a fact. Isn't this the carpenter's son? There was no talk of this is God in the flesh. So they were indignant that I think the Bible shows they wanted to kill him, put him away. What was the event that happened to Jesus between the first time we encountered him in the village of Nazareth and when he suddenly went out preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of heaven has come or is nigh, is here? Now, you got to hear me out. This is not saying that Jesus was, wasn't all God and all man before, but here's what we read. He was born of the Spirit from the beginning, but when he began his public ministry, the Holy Spirit came upon him in a brand new way. Again, everything is a pattern for us to see. We are not Jesus, but there are patterns in the Bible for us to look upon. John the Baptist saw the Spirit descend and remain on Jesus like a dove. And it is not as though Jesus was not endued before. Just this was another way that he would be the first goer, uh, another first fruit or a first example. So everything with Jesus is an example for us. And I'll give you one more. His ministry starts with him being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I find it interesting that so many times people become Christian, they hear the message, they grip with the word, and then I'll get messages saying, oh, you don't know what happened to me, this happened or that happened, and they're negative, they're all bad things, not recognizing, here's another template. His ministry begins with him being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So what makes us think? we wouldn't be tempted as well. We wouldn't be tried. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame about him through all the land, all the region. So it wasn't until the full power of the Spirit was put on display that the devil came to tempt Christ. And I think that is very noteworthy because the devil's not going to bother with people who are already occupied with the world or the flesh, he's not going to bother them. But one who is consumed for the glory of God, look out. So the father kept his son concealed, if you will. No one suspected the child was any different, although there were people that came at the time of his birth or a little later because of the star, because of the wise men, because of Herod. There was a whole litany of things of the Messiah being born. But he wasn't revealed for who he was until God was ready, until the appointed time. And I'm not saying the forces of hell weren't operating before that time. They sure were. Otherwise, Herod would have had his way and he would have killed every male child to thwart 
God's plan, again, much like Pharaoh. In fact, you can see many parallels in the Old and New Testament. They, they go together. We see the forces of evil operating through every age. But specifically here, what I'm trying to point out is the minute somebody is fully committed or dedicated, even in that instant, that's where the devil starts his attack, his method, his see if we can wear you down. Maybe you'll just think you've got such bad luck or you're such a bad person or it couldn't be for you. And this is why I always tell people, expect this. It's not going to be you come and everything goes good. It's going to be you come and everything breaks down and goes to hell in a handbasket until you recognize this is a test that the trying of your faith. So let me go back to where I was. John the Baptist had been told by by God that the one upon whom he saw the Spirit descend and remain would be the one who would baptize in the Holy Spirit. That is John 133. So let's get into the weeds a little bit of this. Baptism with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of Jesus, I said earlier, they were all universally used in the early church. This being the outward confirmation of an inward happening a spiritual grace received, if you will, of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is why it is somewhat disturbing when people who have not been taught, they don't know anything, or people want to baptize their children. There's a reason why you don't even hear about infants being baptized in the Bible. There's a reason for this. Now, Jesus does say, don't, don't prevent or don't hinder the children from coming, but that's not about baptism, because we have to know what we are doing. That is a statement that I know what I'm doing. I am going down in the water, identifying with his death and coming up to rise to walk in newness of life, just like his resurrection. You must have some knowledge of that before it will have value and meaning and mean something. So the outward confirmation of an inward happening, that is water baptism. And after the fact, after we've come to know who Christ is. But here's where we can see the confusion. Baptism with water is the outward sign of what has already occurred. Baptism in Jesus, that which is stated, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, baptized into the Holy Spirit by Jesus, into one body. It might be the reason why we don't read of Jesus baptizing anyone with water. He gave this task to his disciples. If you keep reading, John baptized with water, but Jesus will baptize you with the Spirit and fire. So there's your first kind of first step. We are not praying and asking the Holy Spirit. We are talking to Jesus. He is basically the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. That's the thing that always gets confused. You have people who will be praying and talking to the Spirit of God, and I'm not I'm just saying when we're looking for answers, we've got to go to the source and we've got to kind of unfold and dig out and make sense of things. We read that no one had received the promise of the Father until the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit until Jesus died, rose, and ascended. Even the passage that we read about at the close of John's gospel it says he breathed on them and they received. You have to remember, John wrote after the fact, after Jesus died and ascended or died resurrected and ascended so there are a lot of things put in john's gospel that may be looking back as he was writing but the fact of the matter is that event happened on the day of pentecost so we know that after christ rose from the dead and appeared to his closest followers he had in some way conferred upon them the deposit if you want to say it that way yes and the ceiling that i've spoken of yes he told them that there was something else that they needed and that they had to go into the city and wait to receive it. So this is where I think those second definite work of grace people, they take this and they think, well, that's the second work. No, it's all part and parcel. And the day of Pentecost, as that event, that was unique. Now, Pentecost continues. It's ongoing. It's a harvest of souls. But that event itself was unique and never to be replicated in that way. So... John baptized with water, and you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Those are the words of Jesus. And although no one is Jesus, except Jesus, the believer follows the pattern that Jesus set. So new birth comes, new birth in the spirit, 
corresponds to Jesus being conceived in the womb by the Holy Spirit. The believer is baptized with water, as Jesus was, and after this we are told to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, receiving the power of the Spirit as he did and as the others did as well. Now, if you remember, the 120 waited as he had said. They were in the city, in the upper room, praying, praising, but they had not yet told anyone about Jesus. They weren't talking. They weren't there ministering and telling people about the the great value of learning about Christ, because that would have required the power of God to do so. And they were waiting. He said to them, you will receive power from on high after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses of me. A witness is not just a witness is not just someone who saw something, but one who will attest to what they saw. This is the missing component here. So you'll be witnesses of me, even at the cost of death, which is what our word witness actually means. Martyr is the word, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, let me just put a little footnote in here. You will be witnesses of me. And unfortunately, the modern word witness takes on a very cheapened, people go out witnessing. Do you know Jesus? Do you, have you been saved? Do you, that's, that can't, could never be the meaning of this. Witness is someone who not only saw something, but who will attest to what they saw. Not anything more than if I were to tell you about Jesus, but not in other words, it's like recounting an event that you saw or you witnessed. You were present. You're going to tell somebody. That would be probably the proper concept with an added sidebar, which is there is a risk to this. That's why I believe we took the word martyr into our language. There's a risk to this. Now, he says Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And if you read through the book of Acts, you see that that's exactly what happened. Jerusalem, day of Pentecost. Judea, Samaria, they're all included, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. And this is why when you read the book of Revelations, talking about basically from every tribe and every nation included there. So it's important for us to kind of get out outside the box of our understanding a little bit. Ten days after Jesus basically left to return to the right hand of the Father, on the Feast of Pentecost, the power from on high came down. And I don't think it's a mistake, by the way. Again, 10 days later. What is the number 10? What is 10? Human responsibility. The sound of a mighty rushing wind. Wind usually connotes God's spirit. Flames of or like fire usually equated with the presence of God. Just like the bush that burned but was not consumed. So the Holy Spirit is poured out on these 120, all of them. That was the equipping to go out and teach, proclaim. This is why I will keep saying this. And maybe hopefully there'll be people out there that their eyes will begin to be opened. Because the more you study this, the more you realize, and I'm not saying this because I'm a woman. I'm just telling you, the more you see this, the more you recognize the Holy Spirit was given unto us. Men and women were in that upper room for a purpose. That purpose is teaching and preaching, and nowhere do I read, by the way. I know this were, these were social customs of the day. Let the women teach the women. Let the men teach the men. As long as a person is teaching the gospel, there is no woman or man. There, There's no, uh, let's talk about whatever that pertains to a certain gender. Why is that even relevant? So I can understand if someone is not getting this, it's because they haven't studied and examined the very thing I'm looking at, which I think is for my listening audience. I think you have to come to the conclusion that unless, as I've made some, I know they're probably not, uh, God's probably not laughing at this, but unless the Holy Spirit was playing a game of duck, duck, goose and skip the women, it means everyone in that room was received. The other thing that's interesting is the 120, 12, and the number 10, 12, and the multiplication of 10, which, again, these biblical numbers are, they're not random. They are very important. So you've got the government of God and human responsibility put together 
that should speak enough. So this equipping was to go out to teach and to preach. And I think if anyone else extrapolates out of this, they have an agenda or they don't understand. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not given unto us as a toy or some uh, gift that says I'm special and you're not. So we have the reality that Jesus himself gave this promise. The people basically went to that upper room. And you've got the same pattern, as I said last week. You have the same pattern with the Apostle Paul, who was told to go into the city and wait. And it is that act of faith and obedience coupled together. Uh, and just as I'm going to repeat this again, for the benefit of those who are hard of hearing, you know, you can, people argue this point in Paul, uh, but Paul makes it abundantly clear in Galatians, and he is basically saying uh, and reinforcing what Jesus did when he says there is neither male, female, free, or bond, all are one in Christ. And just look at the people around Jesus, the people he spoke to, the people he included, and that gives you enough information to say all of these people with their agendas are stuck in some sexist mindset. Yeah, I said it. Which in the body of Christ, there is no place for that. I'm sorry. All right. On the Feast of Pentecost, the Father who had promised this outpouring through the ascended Christ shed forth the Holy Spirit from on high upon all flesh, thus opening the passage from the Old Testament, as I quoted before, out of the book of Job. And this new way, this new life, this new birth was poured out upon all who looked unto him for salvation. They were baptized with the Spirit, and this outpouring overflowed upon those that would believe, faith, and receive. So a great crowd gathered at the sight of this event, perplexed by the sound of the followers of Christ who were praising God in languages of far off, far away lands, and the listeners who were in the city for the Feast of Pentecost were amazed to hear these people praising God in languages from their own home and countries, in other tongues which they also didn't recognize. Now, let's just look at that for a second. So all the people who were gathered there could understand what was being said and if this was in any other setting, they would not have been able to understand the language. So whether that was the Holy Spirit opening up their capacity to receive in their own language or to hear in the language they were speaking, I don't know. But again, this is attributed to God. Now, some joked and said the people were drunk. Peter said, no, they're not drunk as you suppose. But this was that spoken by the prophet Joel. And don't think I'm repeating these scriptures because I'm just repeating scriptures. They're all relevant, pivotal parts in looking at every angle to try and get out of this everything that we can. So he, Peter, stands up, preaches the message that births the church into existence. Um, and we, we tend to forget about something. The 3,000 that came into the church in one day, out of mostly out of the old dispensation, had possibly heard about Jesus. This is the mystery. I don't know how you could be living in that land and not hear, hear about the man who professed to be, uh, that was crucified at the hands of the religious leaders and the Romans, and not have heard that this same one rose from the dead. However, it's kind of interesting. So these 3,000 are, are basically birthed into the kingdom out of the old dispensation. They had heard about Jesus. They confessed. They repented of their sins. They were baptized and themselves received the gift of the Holy Spirit that day. So we tend to understand was Pentecost was a genesis, a beginning to be repeated through the book of Acts, if you read it carefully, uh, while the church was yet in its infancy. The next event takes place, as I've already said, in Samaria, the remnant of the old northern kingdom. And I know I've covered this some repetition here, but What's important is to recognize that the people who had settled in Samaria were not accepted by those living in the South. In fact, they were alienated and kind of considered outsiders. So it's very interesting that um, if you want to talk about people hating people, they were hated. Um, we read that one of the men who was appointed to help the apostles had gone to Samaria. And obviously, they had listened to 
the preacher Philip. He spoke with authority and they saw him doing things very much, we'll say, in the fashion or if they had any familiarity with Christ. This was something so novel. We don't know if Philip was great orator, if he was very eloquent. We don't know that. But the Holy Spirit impressed the truth upon them. This is what we have to start recognizing. Peter, it's not that he was eloquent and a great orator. It was the Spirit flowing through him. That's basically God's voice, God's mouthpiece, using this container to be able to uh, do his bidding. It wasn't that Philip was an eloquent, eloquent preacher, but rather the Holy Spirit impressed upon him and upon them. So it goes both ways. There has to be a uh, transponder or, or something that is putting the signal out and a receiver. The reality of what Philip was proclaiming, this event brought them into the kingdom of God through salvation in Christ. And the scriptures say they were baptized with water. That is Acts 8, 5 through 12. When Peter and John arrived, it was as if they could see something lacking in these believers in Samaria. And they laid hands upon them and these, these received the Holy Spirit. And this is the first time we're, we're told about the laying on of hands in this way to receive the Holy Spirit. There wasn't a laying on of hands of the original 120. There wasn't a laying on of hands in the 3,000. We don't read that Philip laid hands on the Ethiopian eunuch. But in the event concerning the believers at Samaria, Peter and John were led to this act of the laying on of hands. As soon as they did this, the Holy Spirit began to be poured out on them, just as it was poured out, out on those in the upper room. So, the Holy Spirit was already indwelling in the believers at Samaria, but after this event, the immediate effect, if you want to say it like this, was witnessed by all. This cannot become a rule because there are cases of the Holy Spirit at, at work in many of these cases where there is no laying on of hands. So we should actually put that aside. It's more actually in the book of Acts as an anomaly than it is the rule of thumb. Paul says there is one Lord, yet we know that there are three parts to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when Paul speaks of one baptism, it should be viewed much like the triune Godhead, with composite actions by which we receive Christ, deposit and seal, and the overflow of the gifts that God gives to us through the Holy Spirit to carry out his work. The other part of that, if you remember the two words that we looked at, um, one of them being the filling for an immediate act to go out and preach or to talk to people. And the other one is for the mind, that which I referred to out of Ephesians 5.18. So my desire in all of these messages is to try and get people to understand that if we're really reading this book, we are already enabled to become vessels, tools useful to him. And I think Many times what happens is we become the hindrance, whether we are afraid, whether we doubt. And, and that fear could be, I'm not sure that God will give me what I need, or I'm not sure that I have what I need. Uh, maybe that is lack of faith. But for some of us, it is exciting to know that God has given us the tools and what we should be asking God for if we love him, if we love the ministry, if we desire to see fruit flourish for his glory, not for ours, then it must be that we are earnestly laying, almost like laying ourselves before God and saying, this is where I'm at, God. Now I can speak as pastor of Faith Center, and as a person who has for the last many, many weeks, and probably more than many weeks, has been incredibly worried, concerned, nervous over what I have been dealing with here for almost 20 years. And that is we've got a lot of faithful people. We've got people who come and go that this is every church. But here's my big issue. And I've been saying this and I've been repeating it. If we're not able to recognize what our responsibility is, we are not God we don't do things in the flesh. We're not operating to do works or to do things by our, our ourselves. But God says, I will put my spirit 
in you. That spirit will flow through you and basically reach the receiver of the person that God's put in front of you, not by coercion, not by any argument. And this is why when we begin to read and it says, let your light shine. People who are light oriented, if you want to put it that way, will be drawn to you because you are light and some people will be repulsed by it. But just remember, God has given the tools. These tools are not for any other purpose. They are to conform us, to help us, to bring our minds to be conformed to the likeness of Christ and the mind of Christ. But also, these are tools designed from the very beginning. Just look at the church. All, all we have to do is ask some very simple questions. And I'll ask you this. Some of you came to the faith. Few came to the faith by watching on TV. Many came to the faith by either somebody bringing or talking or sharing. But this is how the church was built. And some people, I think, think they need some special gimmick or some special something, which again is robbing God of the very gifts that he gave to us to build, to be used, I should say it this way, to build for him. There could be no greater accomplishment or reward than to know, just as I think about how I came to the faith. No one, no one tried to coerce me. It was, I was open my, I'm not going to say that I desired, but I was open. The receiver was open. That's that prevenient grace working. No one had to coerce me or, or have an altar call or make me repeat a prayer. I think as long as we are open to understanding, it's when we let God do what only he can do, then he is glorified. He gets the full glory. Any part of us thinking we had one little iota, it's basically pretty much negates. And we can't just praise God and say, it's all you. That's what I'm looking to accomplish here. And I think these messages contain enough information for us to be able to say, God has equipped us. God has made it possible. And if you look carefully, you will see when we read that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Yes, the flesh can get tired. And we can say our soul could get tired, but the spirit is light and life. So it's time maybe to start looking at how we understand the new creature and all of the activities of God. He gives us enough. I'm sure this will be a familiar saying to you whom the Lord calls. He enables. And yes, go try and find that scripture. But this is what I'm trying to tell you. With God, all things are possible. We will have the victory here. I'm asking all to keep an open mind and an open heart through this series. And let's see what God does with these old crocs of clay. That's my message. Come to this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, worship and bow down.